Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending this webinar with Dr. Lawrence Connor. My name is Pat Bono, president of New York Bee Wellness, which is an independent, educational, grassroots, charitable 501c3 non-membership organization. Its mission is to educate small-scale sideliner and beginning beekeepers. We do have a YouTube site with past in-person and online presentations. New York Bee Wellness also sends out newsletters several times a year. We conduct statewide surveys twice a year for non-migratory beekeepers in New York State. 2021 is our seventh year of collecting data. All right, um, Dr. Connor, thank you very much for being here. Um, welcome back and um, you're on, thank you so much. Thank you, Pat, I appreciate the invite. I uh, hope everybody's doing okay and um, I just uh, put this in here so you knew what, if you haven't seen me before, you have an idea what I look like. That's probably about eight or 10 years ago in, uh, at Lake Mead for one of the Federation meetings or after one of the Federation meetings. Uh, it's always good to get to meeting. Get, it's always good to go to the meetings, but it's better to get out and see the countryside. Uh, tonight, I'm gonna be talking about keeping bees alive. And this is in some ways, based on a book we did a couple of, just a few years ago. Um, we're gonna talk about sustainability uh, uh, and you know, some of the aspects of beekeeping that are on everyone's minds nowadays. And um, I think that I may have more text than I normally do when I, in our talks be, because this is sort of a book-based talk, but it's also important for us, I think at this time of year to uh, look back on what we've done this previous year and then move forward to uh, uh, plan for uh, this next year as much as any of us can plan with uh, COVID and everything else going on. Um, I'm certainly uh, feeling the effects of being invited to come to meetings and then having the meetings uh, canceled or uh, seriously altered because of COVID. Uh, so when we talk about keeping bees alive, I think it's important that we review some of the, uh, you see in the yellow, the highlighted the key factors that are uh, important to most of us as beekeepers. And uh, so if you just go through there and look at the yellow, you see certainly that we have a number of things that we can uh, put our emphasis on. I've always been an educator in, in beekeeping, uh, going back, um, my 4-H days in the 50s and 60s, uh, graduate school days in the, in the 60s and early 70s. And then, of course, my first job was at Ohio State University as an extension edu educator. So um, education has always been a big part of what I do, and it's an important part of what every beekeeper should be involved with. <clears throat> we'll talk a bit, quite a bit about this and how we approach education with beekeeping. If you're a new beekeeper, or if you want to kind of have something to fill your free days or nights uh, as far as some extra activities and reading and programs that we can look at. We've had a real change since the 1980s in terms of the uh, pests that affect our hives. And one of the most important ones, of course, has been the varroa mite. And many of us are looking at uh, what I call mite tolerant stock, or some people call it mite resistant stock. There's a difference there, and I prefer the term tolerant because you, if you truly had resistance, I don't think you'd have any mites present in the hive on a regular basis. Um, and then some of the basic things that we, that we should be concerned about, uh, picking our apiary site, being very careful of what we do, where we put our bees, and how we approach beekeeping as a um, uh, focus of what we're doing and keeping in mind what the bees need. We need to obtain healthy nucleus colonies. We, make, we use some packaged bees and swarm queens. Um, we certainly want to look at our swarms and look at them as a resource, resource as genetics, especially in isolated areas. And I know there's been work that's gone on at, uh, in New York that has been uh, very successful in showing that in isolated areas, 
swarm queens possess traits that are beneficial in our in our bee breeding program. So we want to focus on some of these things. And this is something that just about every beekeeper can be involved with, in, involved with, unless of course you're sitting right next to a large commercial beekeeper who's going to make the isolation factor in, or a challenge. So this is all going to bring us to a sustainable uh, level of bee biology where the bees are healthy and they have fewer mites and we can focus on uh, pest monitoring and treat when we see the threshold numbers reach a point where we need to be focused on, uh, on treatment. I've been doing uh, goal setting for a number of years and it uh, goes back to um, a discussion uh, I had with my wife at the time uh, back in the early 80s and uh, I had just left the program in uh, Florida and you know what I'm going to do when you grow up and of course some people would say I'm still asking that question. So your goal setting may be involved in how many colonies do I want or how many jars of honey do I want to produce a year or how many colonies do I want to put into rental and are they going to be going to almonds or are they going to stay in my home state I'm going to keep them in the county am I just going to move them to a local orchard uh, and how am I going to charge and how will I manage that and who's going to help me move those bees these are all things that come as a result of goal setting I'd like to see more people producing locally raised queens and I think of this as an important part of uh, sustainable beekeeping uh, so you want to develop what I call an elevator business plan. That's a business plan. You can tell somebody on the ride up to the 10th floor uh, in a hotel about what you do. You know, well, my goal is, is, is uh, to do this and this and this. And you need to set your goals uh, quickly and, and clearly. And this will help you focus on what you're going to do. So here are a couple of examples of elevator business plans. Are you going to set up 10 colonies to produce 50 queens each year. Sounds like a simple plan. It was going to require some planning. It's going to require some training. And you're going to have to have some experience on both the number of colonies and raising queens. Or you've been be, uh, keeping bees for more than a few years and you want to have 100 colonies. But you want to average at least 60 pounds per hive or 100 pounds per hive. And then you're going to sell that honey. Uh, you have a plan on where you're going to send it, sell it. You want to sell at retail rather than wholesale because you get more money at retail. And then you have to look at things like farmers markets and selling on the internet. Um, here's an example of my personal objectives. Back about uh, 12 years ago, I, I made the objective, a personal objective of writing 10 B books. That wasn't something that came to me as a uh, flash of uh, brilliance. That was sort of the acceptance of the fact that I had written several books and I was in the process of writing books and that um, I, it's, that started out with writing articles for the bee journals. And so an editor or a beekeeper might have asked, well, are you gonna put this into a book? So, you know, once that idea gets in the back of your brain, it kind of festers and grows. So it was in 2006 and 2008 that the first two books came out. Uh, one, my first edition of Increased Essentials and B Sex, and then Queen Rearing and, and these other books have come along. And now we're down to uh, two years ago, we came out with, or a year ago, we came out with Package Essentials. Uh, even though I'm not a big advocate of packaged bees, um, I use them all the time, and a lot of beekeepers do, and they need to know how to do that correctly. This year uh, coming up, we've just finished and sent off to the printer the third edition of our big textbook, Honeybee Biology and Beekeeping. And so it shows you that over this, in this process, we had all these books coming out and um, it goes back to setting an objective that, you know, am I done yet? Well, maybe, you know, maybe it's time to um, retire. But on the other hand, I still want to do a book on nectar and pollen plants. And I think that would be uh, beneficial for me to get that done. And I think we do still have a need for it in terms of the beekeeping literature. 
Uh, so setting an objective, you want to look at your overall B operation and say, okay, I want to have a certain level of colony survival. This is that goes back to that sustainability component. And so I want to have 80% of my colonies surviving. And, uh, and those of the colonies that I lose, I'm going to replenish every colony with increased colonies that I'm going to make up. And if I can, I'm going to use locally adapted queens in the process of doing this. By combining this as sort of part of your, your objectives, it helps clarify, am I going to buy some queens from Georgia or Hawaii or you know, wherever you may have the option of buying queens? And you have to say, well, what does this fit into? Is this going to help me with my increase or is this going to interfere with have locally adapted queens? So you have to weigh those pros and cons. And in, I'm not saying one is right or one is wrong. It's something that you have to decide and have that as part of your overall planner. Now, if you're fairly new into beekeeping or if you're getting into something specialized like clean ring, you need to focus on education, as we already said. And uh, the concept of pre-training and doing things before you get started with bees or before you get started with uh, queen ring, I think is an important thing for you to look at. And so I've played around with this three by three concept. This actually came from a training I had uh, a number of years ago for fundraising with nonprofits. And they actually used the example of to, to get money out of people, you had to have uh, five methods that you, you expose to people three, five ways. So that's a five by five. I simplified a little bit for beekeeping, um, which doesn't say anything about beekeepers, but it just makes it a little more attainable. So for example, you might wanna look at three books or three audio tapes or they're, they're the equivalent. You might wanna look at three video programs, some of the things that Pat has done already and YouTube sources that are out there. We'll talk about which ones I'd like to recommend in, in just a couple of minutes. And then three courses or B schools or training programs. And yes, COVID has interfered with uh, some of that, but you still can do some of these things online. And you may want to say, do I wanna go down to Jamie Ellis's uh, um, program in, uh, in Florida to see what they're doing and get a different perspective than where I may, where you may be located, whether it's New York or Michigan or somewhere in Canada. And maybe there's something, if you're in Canada, you may wanna focus on that. If you're near Canada, like in New Yorkers, once we can get the border, uh, easy travel into Canada, we may wanna visit at, at uh, the University of Guelph with the excellent programs that Ernesto uh, and others have uh, in, uh, in Ontario. So here are three books, three sets of books. And I've kind of broken this into three, again, the three thing. Uh, so brief pre beekeeping books. There's a great book, introductory book. It's my son's favorite introductory book. It's the the beekeeping hobbyist by Norm Gary, and um, the language is simple. The photos are great. I have, of course, the book on vocabulary essentials uh, that excuse me, my son does, and uh, it evolved out of a conversation we had about uh, he was getting into bees. I never pushed him in it. Uh, he's in his forties. He said. You know, I think I'd like to get a hive of bees. And I said, fine, uh, we need to get you somebody to work with. And he's worked with my brother, who was a commercial beekeeper for a number of years. And um, so as he would work, my, uh, my son, Andy, would come in and say, look, I don't understand all this terminology. And so that evolved into him making a list of terms he didn't understand. And then we put photos with the words, the, the concepts, uh, to, to come up with a book on vocabulary. And so it's been very useful in training new beekeepers and so forth. It's not a beginner's book. It's just a, it's a reference book, but it's it, used by a lot of beginners in, in bee schools and so forth. Once you get into bees, you want to look at uh, probably, uh, and there are other books as well in this department. It's a, a crowded field, if you will. Uh, if you're a great fan of the dummy series, you may well at the beekeeping dummies. Or four dummies. I like to uh, say my beekeepers aren't dummies. So uh, we have the, the bee essentials, the field guide, and uh, trying to balance between 
an expert level of uh, content and uh, non beekeeper uh, coming up with a book and focusing on many of the mistakes beekeepers make and get people off to a better start. I've been a long fan of uh, Diana Cemetery and Al Avatabi's Beekeeper's Handbook uh, for, that Cornell publishes, extremely well researched uh, and an extensive biography. As you get into a more advanced book, you might want to look at uh, the, the textbook that Dewey, Karen, and I work on. Uh, we've just done the third edition. Uh, the second edition is still in print, and that's the decision you may have to face whether you want to buy uh, the second and or the third or both. And then I like uh, the new ABC XYZ of Bee Culture that Keith Delaplane edited, and there are a lot of new uh, references in that book. Um, and, you know, I contributed certain things that a lot of people did, uh, adding to a really useful book that kind of stretches the uh, coverage that uh, you have. So if you pick out one of each, you know, you could do, of course, both of them on, on this list. But if you did at least one of these, it's a way of getting started and, and taking a look at how you're going to approach your, your basic training. Video programs, I mentioned the University of Guelph. Uh, Ernesta Guzman and Paul Kelly uh, have done a really nice job of uh, putting these programs together. At, at, in Guelph, uh, the YouTube programs, they're very accessible. And uh, you can just go to the, uh, the website for the University of Guelph and beekeeping. And uh, I really recommend this series, it's excellent. I also recommend Jamie Ellis's program out of uh, Florida. Uh, it's certainly better for, perhaps for some of the Southern beekeepers, a little more focused towards some of their concerns, but really most beekeeper concerns are every beekeeper's concern. And um, I especially like the fact that you've got excellent quality and good science represented there. For more of a Midwestern view, you may want to look at the University of Minnesota and uh, the program that uh, Gary Ruder put together before his retirement. And uh, these programs are very uh, entertaining, they're instructive, and they cover a wide range of beekeeping topics. Well, Every um, beekeeper area has uh, different programs. For example, here in Kalamazoo, Michigan, where I'm located, we have a Kalamazoo Bee Club and they have a one day program in late winter. Last one was in, uh, uh, it was a virtual. Uh, state organizations, uh, many have annual meetings or semi-annual meetings. Um, Michigan and traditionally has always had three meetings a year. In the summer, they do a picnic. So the fall meeting, spring meeting, and a picnic. Uh, the picnic has probably lost popularity, but uh, the fall meeting and the winter and the uh, uh, fall winter meeting, whatever you want to call it, and then the spring meeting. The spring meeting is held at uh, the uh, Kellogg Center at the Michigan State University uh, campus, and it is a usually a two, two and a half day program, which uh, when we're able to meet in person, it's a really good program for a lot of beekeepers coming from neighboring states and provinces. Uh, you have three regional groups in the United States, and actually that does include part of Canada, like the Eastern Apicultural Society includes Ontario and the provinces, the Eastern provinces. Heartland Apicultural Society is uh, quite functionally any colony, any uh, state that uh, is in Kentucky or in borders with Kentucky. And the Western Apicultural Society deals primarily with uh, uh, all the states in the West Coast and uh, into the Western provinces. So it's a uh, uh, way of focusing uh, on your tra travel, travel budget, how you want to do this. And of course, once you start going to some of these meetings, you probably get involved and want to be um, going on a fairly regular basis. Well, then there's what I call routine learning, and that would be getting a subscription to the American Bee Journal, the uh, 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 Bee Culture Magazine, uh, reading your local state and uh, local bee club newsletters, probably most of them are now uh, online. And then if you don't have one, you want to find a mentor. Uh, if you've survived beekeeping as a beginner without a mentor, you may need a mentor as you get into queen rearing. 
and find somebody who can you can visit and maybe you know, barter some labor and get some instruction and maybe you'll end up with uh, some of the queens you help that person produces so that's a good way of doing that then you have two national organizations the american honey producers association just met uh earlier this month in uh louisiana and the american beekeeping federation will be meeting next month in uh, uh, Las Vegas. So these are different levels, different concepts, but it's a way of increasing and continuing your education. Put this quote in, uh, Dr. Eva Crane was the founder of the International Bee Research Association. Dame Eva, she was honored by the queen in England. And um, she makes the statement, you must remember that you were a beginner for the first 20 years. I'm not sure that's right. I think it may be like the first, first 50 years, but um, you're always learning with beekeeping and with working with bees. And it's important that you acknowledge that and accept the fact that don't try to force the bees to do something they don't really want to do. Well, that's all preliminary work. So let's sit down, get down and, and talk about how we can get some of this, uh, uh, the important work here and, and how to keep some of these bees alive. I organized that book and this talk on five key concepts, uh, mite tolerance, site nutrition, mite management, sustainable biology, and sustainable management. All right, there's some overlap here and that's what you would expect. Let's go through each of these and uh, kind of talk about how this all works together. Um, <laughs> Can I just, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. All right, now, one of the things that uh, when the varroa mites came into North America in the 1980s, one of the things that happened was that John Harbo and now late uh, uh, researcher at Michigan State, uh, Roger Hubengarner, uh, worked to collect colonies uh, and queens from survivor colonies that had was were still alive after the initial onslaught of varroa mites in commercial operations, hobby operations, wherever it was. And these queens were sent to John Harbo at the uh, Baton Rouge lab, and they became a part of the VSH, the varroa sensitive hygienic stock, which uh, was part of a a survivor program. In other words, these bees were alive. In, quite, in some cases, these bees were not good bees as far as beekeepers were concerned, but they were important because they carried some genetic, we think genetic, uh, it could have been luck, but in most cases they had some a genetic uh, basis of surviving. Um, a number of years later, uh, Dr. Tom renderer at the USDA lab in uh, uh, also in uh, Louisiana, in Baton Rouge, went to Russia, Eastern Russia, and he collected uh, bees that would that were originally sent to this part of Russia by the Tsar. So we're looking what 100 and some years ago. And the Tsar sent these bees out because they were, these are regions in Eastern uh, Russia that were um, a lot of basswood. And so there was a good honey and they wanted productive colonies. But what's unique about this particular area, it's also an area where another honeybee species, Apis serrana, coexisted. Apis serrana was the original host for Apis, uh, for Varroa. And the mites jump ship, if you will, from Apis uh, uh, serrana to Apis mellifera. And even though the colonies were doing well, they were now infested with the varroa mites. Um, Tom um, Renderer would say that in the period of years that the Western honeybee was coexisting with the mites from the Eastern honeybee, that they developed survival uh, mechanisms, genetic mechanisms to survive these bees. And whether or not that's developmental or hygienic or 
uh, grooming or a combination of these things, maybe some other factors are involved, that the Russian bees were brought into the United States, maintained in quarantine for a period of time, and then the stock was released to beekeepers. And the Russian bee breeding program is now a, a key part of um, a, a number of beekeepers' lives because they're, they're maintaining the stock and they're providing a, an avenue toward um, some mite resistance or tolerance that uh, many people are looking for. Uh, <clears throat> so that was the base. That was, these two were based on survivors. Other people went out and specifically look for um, certain traits. Um, probably the most famous one is the Minnesota hygienic, Marla Spivak and Gary Ruder and the, and the people there in Minnesota actually developed techniques. They were using techniques that were developed in the Tucson lab by Steve Tabor to um, select for American fall brood resistance. But the, the same mechanism worked for um, hygienic selection and they, they'd kill a patch of brood and they'd put it back in the hive and see how quickly the bees would remove that brood. And the bees that removed the dead brood rather quickly were considered to be hygienic. In other words, they did not tolerate uh, dead uh, bee brood uh, in the hive and they remove it. Of course, I would think after a couple of days, it would be kind of smelly and the bees would want to reject it anyway. But some colonies don't uh, do a very good job with that. And so here is an example of the Minnesota hygienic bees have been selected for a particular trait. And um, this trait of, of uh, hygienics is interesting because it works not just on varroa mites, but also on brood diseases like American fall brood, also works against uh, uh, chuck brood. And, and so there are, it's sort of like one biological system works well to, uh, uh, what do you want to say, uh, control a, a variety of problems for, uh, and issues within the colony. Recently, you've probably heard about mite biting, a bite the mite, uh, or grooming behavior. And this has come out of Purdue University, as well as a number of pretty bright beekeepers around the country who have discovered that bees and bee trees that are survived um, have this grooming trait where the, the bees will actually bite the mite, causing damage to the body of the mite, and the mite dies. Uh, and so this grooming behavior has become a focus of many beekeepers in terms of the, in their selection program. So here's some, a, a place where this has evolved in terms of, or yeah, evolved, and, and it's, there's some natural selection here, but the beekeepers are going out and looking for it. So here's uh, Chris McGibbon, who does the instrumental insemination on this program at Purdue uh, to maintain this, this grooming stuff. There's a third area here that we haven't done much with, and at least not directly, uh, and that's with developmental adaptations. Uh, one possible adaptation, well, you, you know of one, and that's a shorter brood development period. And... Uh, uh, then the other one that's, that John Harbo thought he had with the, uh, the survivor stock was a suppressed mite reproduction. His was more of a hygienic thing, as it turned out. But there may be some mite uh, reproduction suppression going on there as well. Um, and um, no, I wasn't done yet. OK, so the shorter developmental period, you know one, and that's the African bee. The African bee develops. Uh, in what, about 14 days and rather than 16 days as a worker. And so the mites are uh, not less likely to develop on the, the worker brood. Of course, they'll develop on the drones, but you've got a shorter developmental period here. And I don't know of anyone who's looked at our North American strains or races or queen families to develop a shorter developmental period, but I think it is one of the things we may want to look at. Certainly, uh, the suppressed mite reproduction is an area that uh, we continue to have a lot of interest in, or not a lot, but some interest in 
certainly in the scientific level, what can we do that's going to make this bee taste bad to the mite, repel the mite somehow, um, uh, deflect them in terms of their reproduction? Well, one of the questions beekeepers usually ask, how do I use these stocks? And the first of all, uh, you'd have to obtain some. So you have to say, okay, uh, I'm going to collect, uh, uh, buy a breeder queen from uh, whoever is producing. John Harbo sells some of his, his breeder queens, uh, as do a number of people. And so you may be able to get certain type. You might be able to get um, some hygienic stock, or you might get some of the uh, uh, grooming stock that people have. And then you may want to mate these daughter queens, you produce daughters through queen rearing, and then mate them to survival colony drones from uh, colonies that you've selected and adapted for your area. And so uh, if you found uh, queens from a uh, number of swarms that you found in an isolated area, wherever you live, and you feel like they have some adaptations for survival, you may want to use that for the drone side of the cross. Um, let's see, did I go backwards here? Yeah, all right. So that sort of ends the, the selection. There's a lot more we can say there, but let's just move on here. I'm not touching anything, so things are a little touchy here today. All right, so, um, all right, here we go. So, um, we did that, okay. Site selection, Slide, site issues. I know that um, many of you have no uh, option on where you keep your bees. You're gonna keep them in your backyard. But you have to look at your backyard and say, is this the best area I can keep my bees? Or would I be better to go to my, my sister's place and keep bees on her farm, um, you know, with a, a fence around it to take care of cattle and bears and whatever else you might have to deal with. Um, you wanna look at this in terms of several factors. One is the security issue. Um, you know, I'm in, I'm in the city of Kalamazoo. I have a couple of colonies of bees in the backyard, but it's such situated in such a way that I'm not even sure the neighbors know it, or if they do know it, they don't care. Um, and they're pretty isolated and they're, they're kind of forced by fencing and foliage to, dry, to fly straight up. You may not have that in wherever you are. And so you want to find an area, but also you want to find an area that has good food supply. And early in the season, mid season, late season, these are things you want to understand. And um, in that list of the books you should look at, you probably should throw in one of the reference books on honey plants and and that's one of the ones in my goals. Remember, I want to work on that. We don't have the, the perfect plant book that we need. There's some old reprints that are out there that are probably as good as you're going to get. But what you have to understand, you see the little chart there, one mile, two mile, three mile, four mile, how many acres a four mile radius represents. That's 33,000 acres of bees fly for four miles. That's a lot of real estate. And when you look at an area, whether you're in a city or if you're in a, uh, a, a rural situation, you could be in a agricultural zone or you could be in a forested region. And you have to look at the um, number of acres of potential forage. And it may be down to individual trees within that forage that, okay, you may be in, in a location with really good black locusts you may have really good uh, sumac, you may have really good um, basswood. Uh, in other areas, you may not have these. So you wanna look at a mixture of these things. And then you wanna look at the agricultural practices. Are you basically in a corn and uh, bean area? Or are you, well, let's like take apple orchards. Apples are great while they're in bloom, but during the rest of the season, the apple orchard is basically a desert because it's being hit with pesticides on a regular basis. And if there are, uh, unless it's an, op an organic operation, it's probably going to be bad on your bees. So you have to understand where you are and how this is going to work together. 
and um, try to get it. You know, I always tell new beekeepers they they should try to chart out the plants in their area and try to come up with something that's going to be beneficial. And sometimes just a move of, of colonies two or three miles, or so you're establishing an apiary and uh, you just get out your Google Maps and map it out there and take a look and say, well, if I move from Southern Kalamazoo County to Northern Kalamazoo County, I get into a different agricultural area. And that is true in Kalamazoo, Southern part of the state, it produces a lot of seed corn, heavy pesticide use. Northern part of the, the, the county is less well um, focused like that and more residential. Well, then you have the issues of what the individual homeowners are using. The other aspect of site, uh, besides, of course, of the, the human component, uh, I mentioned the neighbors knowing about bees, and you may have an issue with a neighbor if you're in an urban area. Uh, if you're in a town or a, uh, you get bees on the roof of a, your skyscraper in downtown uh, New York City or your you know, six story uh, building in San Francisco. I've been to places like that where beekeepers keep their bees. Well, there's a lot of plants in both New York City and in San Francisco. They're both areas that are probably pretty good for nectar production and pretty good for pollen production. But then you have to look at the human component. And are these bees going to cause problems? You're going to have vandalism. Uh, the neighbor's going to complain. Um, when you extract the honey, are you going to make a you know, an attractive nuisance with robbing, the bees robbing out the equipment. I'm of course always concerned about um, theft and, and vandalism in terms of people running over your beehives with a snowmobile or a four wheel truck. I've seen pictures, uh, I think Dewey Karen gave me a, a photo once of somebody had set their bees along a, a, a rural country lane and somebody had gone along with the four wheel drive and just gone from one nuke to the next and smashed them. And so took out all that effort at raising queens. And it's just a, you know, probably didn't do the tires any good, but probably didn't hurt them too much. And, you know, human vandalism is something I'll never understand, but there's a lot about humans I don't understand. So we're okay there. Uh, theft and, uh, you know, many beekeepers have rendered their bees uh, from the, uh, in, in brokers, or, you know, send them over to brokers in California and the bees never come back. They're, they've been stolen. And so this is a huge problem in California. <clears throat> and then there's the issue of colony density. Um, when the oranges are in bloom in Florida, there's, there used to be a lot of uh, nectar supply, but once the oranges finished blooming, um, the bees were um, robbing each other for, for food. Uh, did I... Do two at once, yes. Uh, I mentioned bears. You may have an issue with wind. I just uh, lost the fence last weekend with that windstorm that came through here. Uh, it's clocked officially at 65 miles an hour, which my daughter who lives in Alaska says just a good breeze. Um, and then, um, yeah, extreme sun ex exposure, fire exposure. Of course, everything out in the West Coast has had to deal with fire. And here's Ted Jones dealing with one of those 100 year floods. Um, and, uh, you know, that stream only floods every 100 years. Well, it's not quite right because, you know, you got a kind of a, you know, the math is that once out of 100 years, you'll get it. You might get them two or three years in a row. And uh, probably nowadays that's more likely going to happen than not. I mentioned pesticides as a concern. And then, of course, diseases from uh, other beekeepers. A beekeeper that comes in that's got a problem with European or American fall brood, or worse yet, a huge mite load. And uh, you get the varroa bomb going off and you have issues there. Here's an environmental issue I've not run into before until recently, and that's when bees were downwind of an alcohol fermentation plant, fermenting the uh, corn into alcohol for uh, gasoline use and um, bees were suffering as a result of too much alcohol in the air, I guess. Um, not sure it was fatal to the bees, but it didn't do them any good. All right, number three, mite management. Get a drink here. All right. 
if we if we're going to go into beekeeping we have to be in the mite business <clears throat> just the way it is nowadays it's just uh, that's new it's you know you know i've been keeping bees since the 1950s 1980s we had to learn about mites uh, first the tracheal mite and then the varroa mite the varroa mite's still with us and probably will be um for the next couple of generations of beekeepers until they come up with something that's very successful uh, at either eliminating the bees or eliminating uh, beekeeping. Uh, I'm not sure which is going to happen first. Uh, so we have the concept of best management practices, and I'll get into that. IPM, and then, then sampling and treatment. So let's get into each of those and see. Uh, so best management plan. Uh, yeah. So best management practices. Okay. You're going to... Uh, develop a, a system of keeping bees that's going to be effective and practical. It's going to improve the health and the productivity of the colonies while reducing any risk. So you're not going to go out, you know, the medical concept of do no harm. This is part of that, but not all that's involved. Uh, integrated pest management, I think, yeah, here we go. Uh, so here are the key words I want you to you're going to monitor pests, their numbers, and then try to figure out what the locally adapted um, threshold is. In other words, uh, in, in my area, we figured two mites per hundred in a sampling technique. Anything uh, more than that, you're going to have to treat. Some people say one mite per hundred, I've got to treat. So find out what the, the current thinking is. And on most of these things, we've become usually become more conservative as time goes on. And then to figure out what are the safest compounds that we're able to use. With other issues, we may want to look at colony removal, have a nursery yard, or to use the old government uh, euphemism for killing a colony, you're going to depopulate the hive and take a colony that's got a very bad case of chalk brood and destroy the bees. and destroy the equipment, burn the equipment, or bury the equipment, whatever has to happen, so that that level, I'm not recommending that necessarily, but some people do that because it's part of their concept of in integrated pest management. It's also going to limit the spread to other colonies, and that could be a real concern. There are a number of things that, in, that go into cultural uh, practices like drone brood removal, uh, drone destruction, uh, screen bottom boards, removing old comb on a two, three, four, or five year basis, uh, and creating a break in the in the brood cycle. We'll talk about those, and then the genetic practices, as we've just discussed, of getting mite tolerant, disease tolerant queen lines that are going to help us with our colonies. So all of this comes into this this general area we call integrated pest management. All right, I just want to make sure I'm not jumping here. So we're going to sample for mites. We want to, uh, you, this is the soapy water technique. Uh, I also use the, the powdered sugar technique. One of my first meetings with the um, with Pat was with uh, sampling out in the uh, uh, in apiary with powdered sugar. And here we're looking at the threshold of two mites per 100 nurse bees. We collected 300 um, uh, bees and a, about half a cup of bees, I believe it was, and then put that into the powdered sugar. And the nice thing here with that method was that the bees didn't die. In this system, the bees are killed. They're in a, a soapy water, or in this case, I think it's antifreeze, um, windshield wiper fluid. And then you look at the number, the shake that vigorously, and then count the number of mites that fall through a screen that's between those two jars and look at the number of mites that are there. And if you're with 300 bees, you say if six or more, you now need to treat that colony. We have, of course, a number of uh, compounds that are available for mite control. They have the synthetic materials, uh, Apovar, Apistan, um, Checkmate. And then you have or the organics, the Apigard, Apolife Ap Var, uh, which have you know, thymol, thymol eucalyptus, and various other essential oils. And then you have the acids. So 
um, formic acid, oxalic acid, hop guard. These are, these are out there. I'm not recommending anyone or saying yes or no to anyone. You have to find out what is working in your area. And that's your responsibility as a beekeeper is to talk to other beekeepers and find out what's working in this area. I, I personally have never had any success with hop guard. Um, so, you know, it's it may work for other people, but it has not worked for me. That gives me other options to look at in terms of what I'm going to do in our treatment. I've actually turned all of my treatment responsibilities over to my son and he seems to enjoy that part of beekeeping. I've always found it to be a little bit uh, distasteful, but you know, I'm more inclined to do things like uh, cultural things and um, drone brood removal and split the brood. Um, so you go out there and make up a nuke. And uh, that is something that I, I think that many of you probably understand. It's more fun to do something positive with your bees and create a situation where the queen's not able to lay for several days or weeks. And then uh, the, the bees emerge and the, there's a break in the mite reproduction cycle. Um, other people for other diseases are gonna have a, a culling technique with their, their combs. And then more and more people are dating their combs so that they know every five years, they need to take that beeswax out and um, melt it down and put new foundation in or, brand, or maybe even put in brand new combs. Screen bottom boards. Um, yeah, there's pros and cons on that. And I think people that have had, had success with screen bottom boards have been very, uh, very diligent in doing the treatments with the powdered sugar methods. Uh, heat, I've never used heat or the, the mite zapper, um, but I understand the biology behind it. And it's worth looking at as far as an option in your, your mite control. One of the things that I'm excited about is I think there's a lot of future in mite control. One would be a, a potential pheromone trap, or perhaps more correctly, a caramone trap that, that would attract varroa mites based on the odor that the drones produce, drone brood produces, and uh, drawn into a trap, kind of like a, a roach hotel, uh, where the roaches check in and don't check out. You want to have something where the mites go into a trap and are destroyed. That doesn't exist as far as I know but I think it's something that's in the future. And then other bio, biological control agents. Uh, some people have used uh, nematodes on uh, small high beetles and other people have used, uh, I've been looking at mites that would be parasitic on the varroa mite. I have no information that that's out there, but I think it's a possibility and should be explored. And then true genetic resistance where the uh, Varroa mite just is not able to reproduce on um, a particular strain of bees. And I think that's something that's down the road, but maybe in the next generation or two. But sustainable biology, what do I mean by that? That's really what we were talking about with the do no harm concept, where you, you want to work, sure, work carefully. You don't kill the queen. You don't want to split your bees to make increased colonies when the weather's too cold or it's going to be too cold. I've seen splits in Northern Vermont that were made up one weekend and the next weekend there were six inches of snow on the ground and a cold spell came through and the brood was black because it had been killed by uh, nothing more than just neglect and not enough bees to take care of that brood. Bees were still alive. They probably would cover, recover with a little more TLC by the beekeeper. But you know, one of the lessons there is to look at the weather map and make sure um, you, you're doing things at the right time of the year. Um, and if I'm suggesting a certain level of paranoia, I'm sorry, but it's probably necessary with all the things going on with the climate. Um, one of the things that I have an ongoing battle with certain beekeepers in my life are, is comb spacing. Uh, small high beetles are very notorious for getting in between two combs that are too close together. They lay their eggs in that tight spot. You get 300, 600 eggs that hatch and then you, count, you lose the colony 
because the beetle larvae are sliming out the hive. Uh, another way of killing bees is to leave bees in an orchard when they're, you know they're going to be spraying. And uh, uh, so you just have to be very careful about um, you know, if, you, if you're going to do one thing, you have to follow up so you're not going to cause harm. And then contaminating hives with diseases. Um, I had a long con conversation with a researcher in uh, uh, Florida that indicated that uh, we are probably spreading more viruses than we realize just by using a smoker, hive tool, and gloves. And so, uh, some of the bee viruses that we have probably could be static in a in a closed room for two three years and still cause issues still be viable viruses and you know we're all becoming advanced advanced degrees because of another virus that affects humans we have to keep in mind that some of these things with bees and viruses are probably just as important that we understand it um, and my old pet peeve is so uh, beekeepers that grow too fast. They, they go from two hives to 200 to 2000 in a matter of a couple of years. And um, then they're in bankruptcy or um, they've created a, a disease mass or the colonies all crash and die. So one of the things I like to remind people is that if we're gonna work with bee bi bees, we have to understand bee biology. We have to understand the concept of the community stomach and um, that there's a lot of food sharing going on that uh, years ago they used radioactive isotopes in the matter of a few hours the bees had spread that radioactive honey uh, throughout the entire colony so just in the, the, the community stomachs if something bad happens in the hive it's going to be shared and most beekeepers just don't seem to get that fact, yet it's basic bee biology. The other thing is uh, honeybee reproduction and, and mating. For the number of beekeepers I talk to that think that that queen that is in that queen cell in their one hive is going to mate with the drones from that very same hive. Well, that's not the way it works. On the other hand, uh, because that's one of their nature's way of avoiding inbreeding, but also beekeepers have to keep in mind that if you have a large number of um, uh, queens in production and you are trying to mate them with the same genetic type of drone, that's going to create an inbreeding situation as well. Well, there are risks involved in everything in beekeeping. There's a risk in, in swarming. The, the, the bees may go out and swarm, but you have to keep in mind that about 25% of the colonies that are queenless do not get a successful replacement queen and you end up with problems with uh, drone layer colonies where the drones start producing, not drone layers, uh, uh, laying workers. And you get laying workers and the colony dies because there's not enough uh, viable worker bees left. Um, so as we, as we go on here, I said, I told this is, you know, the sustainable biology African bees, the uh, shorter developmental time with the African bees. Uh, and I think we have to realize the fact that we have a number of beekeepers that are bringing bees from Florida and other states where uh, African bees are here in the United States. They're coming into Northern states. They're causing problems with some defensive behavior. And we have to be very careful about that and in our colony placement. And we also have to have a plan for either depopulating, killing those bees, or um, yeah, uh, an aggressive requeening program. Uh, drone biology, uh, I think this is kind of repeats what I just said, that the, the, the drone brood is a, attracted to the varroa mites. It's not a pheromone, it's a caramone, different class of chemicals of you, because it's dealing with two different species. If it were the same species, it would be a pheromone. And so uh, the varroa mites are not honeybees. They're being attracted to this drone larvae. And uh, so we could figure out some way of um, using this. I think it would be a good way of uh, 
uh, dealing with some of these issues that we have using some of the knowledge we have of bee biology, uh, drone biology. Uh, we also know that because of the various miticides and their synergy with ag chemicals that drones are very sensitive to or um, susceptible to uh, viability problems, sperm viability, number of sperm and the viability of the sperm and even sterility. So you might have a colony that's producing drones, but to use the, the old euphemism, they're firing blanks. And so this is something we have to keep in mind. I'm not sure it's happening in anybody's bees, uh, but on the other hand, I'm not sure it isn't a widespread problem. I said earlier that 25% of all queens fail to mate. And uh, I, I emphasize this a lot nowadays because most of the problems I see with hobby beekeepers and sunline beekeepers is that they don't recognize the fact that if a colony swarms and that swarm goes into um, a bee tree, that colony will probably replace that queen during the nectar flow. When you catch a swarm and put it into your colony, you probably don't want to see them supersede, but they probably will. And because of problems with um, dragonflies and weather and natural reasons, just figure that about 25% of those queens will not be successful in doing what you want them to do. And so as a result, you're going to end up with uh, drone laying colonies. Um, so keep in mind that these swarm queens are often old and most of them are going to be superseding. So also to give the credit to the, the queens, they're also being affected by mitocytes and ag chemicals. All right. One of the things that's interesting, uh, uh, Roger Hoopengunner just passed away, uh, breakout COVID. Um, and he was a, a mentor of mine uh, as an undergraduate and served on both my master's and uh, doctoral programs as a committee member. He did work as a, his PhD on the size of queens and the number of ovarials. And that, that, that thesis basically said the bigger the queen is, the more vigorous the colony is going to be because that queen's producing more ovarios and therefore more eggs. One of the selection techniques that I'd like to see people try to figure out a way of doing is to use large version queens over 160 milligrams. And uh, that would be a way of um, kind of selecting. You might want to wait until the queens are released and um, you know, check for new queen or another queen in that hive. And uh, so there, there's some techniques here that I think we need to explore and, and try to increase our productivity of our, our colonies. The other thing that um, I mentioned in terms of making up increased colonies uh, is uh, a break in the brood cycle, which now has a name that's called sequestering the queen. And uh, so you keep the queen in a cage so she cannot lay. And uh, it's, you know, you figure out whatever the recommended predetermined time period is, whether it's a week or two weeks, creating a break in the brood cycle. And uh, that's kind of a sustainable management plan that you can develop, you, you can have that would benefit the colony and, and do some good for the colony. Uh, Nutrition, boy, we've got a lot we've done in, on nutrition. There's a lot out there in terms of nutrition and uh, trying to maintain our diversity and avoid monocultures. Uh, an apple orchard is a monoculture. If you're in a large apple area, you know, look and see what else you've got. You know, you've got to find something that's fairly diverse so the bees are well fed to go in the winter. And uh, so, I'm using an old uh, thing I learned back when I was an undergraduate. You always want to have a minimum of three frames of sealed honey in any colony at any time, a large colony at any time. And that just guarantees that they'll have enough food 
to, to survive um, during a, a dearth or a break in the uh, nectar flow. And uh, if you're a new beekeeper and you're just starting out, you say, should I harvest the honey? And you say, well, I'll leave that honey on the colony over the winter. And you can always harvest it in the spring or use it to build up your colonies. Herbicides are something that we're seeing more and more information about. Um, and also fungicides, fungicides affecting bee behavior and development. And it, especially at the sublethal level, all insecticides, herbicides uh, can cause issues with their synergy with other chemicals. And that is something that um, it's hard to understand. But it, when you see the data on some of these things, it can be pretty um, uh, upsetting. When you're working with your bees, you may want to develop a technique of sterile practice. Um, I try to use uh, the hive tool. I put the hive tool into the hot uh, smoker while it's still going to sterilize that smoker and remembering not to grab it by the hand and uh, get a, a nice scar on your hand, but uh, heat up the hive tools so that you melt off the wax and the propolis, but more important, kill the viruses and the bacteria that are on that hive tool. When you go from one bee yard to another, or if you're going from your bees to another beekeeper's bees, this is absolutely essential. Or you could scrape and, and wax, excuse me, uh, use alcohol, but the, there's nothing as effective as the or maybe even as quick as the heat. Um, one of the things that it, it always amazed me when I visited commercial beekeepers is that I'd see chalk brood in um, colonies that would be used as grafting mothers. And uh, so they were pro propagating chalk brood by producing queens. And uh, whether or not that's caused an effect on their, the daughter queens, just, you know, it just indicates a sloppy technique and that you don't graft from a disease colony. You don't produce queens in, 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 if you could, drones in colonies that are diseased, have a high mite load. I'm, a, of course, wrote a book on making increase and uh, talked about the, the break in the brood cycle. Uh, we like the fact that young queens are gonna build up the colony quickly and you can evaluate or test the nuke and see how they're doing, whether it's for hygienic behavior or some other characteristic like grooming behavior, see what their bees are doing, and then use that as a uh, selection ba uh, basis. Uh, other nuclei could be used as support hives or as Mike Palmer in uh, Vermont says, use them as brood factories, uh, using them to pull out frames of brood, but keeping extra colonies uh, in the nuclear state is going to help you build back up your colonies, keep your colony numbers strain, uh, strong and steady so that you will have a uh, way of keeping this going. Once you get the, the nucleus uh, um, production down, you can sell a few and uh, uh, so nukes, I mean, and maybe the queens uh, and use them as a way of uh, making some money. And as the value of the nukes increases, um, you know, there's more money to be made. <clears throat> Some beekeepers are going to use packaged bees to sustain established new apiaries. And so if you're going to do that, you may want to look at some mite tolerant stock. And uh, Oliveras in California is selling the Saskatraz. I get a mixed report on Saskatraz. I've had two Saskatraz packages and uh, they both did well and they both died. So I'm not sure what that means. It's a small sample. So, so there you are um, in terms of keeping bees alive. Just uh, I've got to get my traditional advertisement in here. So Bee Essentials, a field guide is the one I mentioned. It's fairly good for newer beekeepers. And uh, Rob Muir is a non-beekeeper and just try to get somebody involved who could bring a different perspective into this. Uh, just a couple of years ago, we did Keeping Bees Alive, which is the topic of this talk. Uh, this is the second edition of Honeybee Biology and Beekeeping, and now for the first time anywhere, 
uh, you're seeing the cover for the new third edition of Honeybee Biology and Beekeeping, which will be coming out in the first quarter of uh, next year. Uh, we, Dewey and I have spent the last uh, two years adding to it, and uh, we've got, we're up to 480 pages, which is about 140 more pages, added a couple of new chapters, expanded several sections. We had a lot of new um, artwork, and I think it's going to be pretty exciting. So um, the bad news about publishing a book right now is that like wooden goods, uh, paper is made from wood. So uh, the quotes for the printing is scary, but you know, we got to deal with. It. Here's the vocabulary book I mentioned that my son and I did. Um, Andrew's a uh, social worker by uh, trade, and he just felt we needed to have a good book on vocabulary. Uh, this is one of the books on uh, the second edition of the book on increase. <clears throat> and uh, you, know, you look over here on the uh, left, you see uh, I draw on Langstroth, Doolittle, Brother Adam, Mike Palmer, and others in putting some of these different techniques together. A lot of different ideas in this book, and I recommend it for people who are thinking about getting into bees. I have a new book on package essentials. That's the photo from the cover. Um, and then so sort of background, a little more uh, advanced to the mating biology of honeybees I did with the Kronigers, Jamie Ellis, uh, a couple of years ago. Nice book. And um, we uh, had a lot of fun doing it. The Kronigers are German researchers. Nicholas used to be the um, lab leader at Oberhersel. I don't, yeah, Oberhersel. And uh, Gunnar and his wife is just as amazing because <clears throat> I asked her, you know, something that she does that nobody really appreciates. And the fact is that she studied Apis dorsata, the, the big comb honeybee in, in Southeast Asia. To do it, she had to learn, take a ropes course and go up 200 feet in the air, hanging from a rope. And she said, it's pretty good for a German housewife. So uh, she is very modest about all that, but she's just as accomplished, you know, as a doctor, just like her husband. Um, one of the books that I've had a lot of fun with is Be Sex Essentials. Uh, it's really a basis of some of the first articles I wrote. <clears throat> and uh, recently Amazon put it on a watch list because of the title, you know, whether or not it was passing muster. It did. Um, once they figured out it was about bees and not humans. And then a couple of classics, uh, Do a Little uh, Scientific Queen Ring and uh, A Year in the Out Ape Area. Uh, just having these books back in print makes me happy. So there we are. Um, I can, uh, Pat, you want me to look at the- uh, Yeah, can you see the uh, Q&A list? Yeah. When warming honey that is crystallized, what is the safe temperature to not damage the quality of the honey? I'm not too sure where the point is where, I mean, damaging honey is time and temperature. So what, you can go up to 180 degrees, 160 degrees for a short period of time. Uh, but if I were going to be liquefying honey in a hot room, I'd probably take the temperature up to 100, 110 degrees and uh, over a slow period of time. And so I, I'd appreciate help on that one um, because that's not uh, an area that I'm, I, I don't do much honey packing. I don't do any actually. Uh, what about various podcasts? Or I don't know anything about podcasts. Sorry, I don't do that. Um, are grooming, VSH, et cetera, known as recessive trait or could be shown as dominant trait like honey production or aggress aggressive? Um, yeah, well, you have to look at each trait one at a time. First of all, I don't think that uh, honey production is a dominant gene. Uh, it's probably a, a combination of many genetic uh, components. And uh, maybe the def what I call defensive behavior is a little more uh, trimmed down to a few genes. Grooming behavior, I think is probably, this could be something that is you either have it or you don't. So it's probably more of a, a dominant gene. VSH, varroa sensitive hygienic. Um, yeah, that's probably a mix of things too. 
How many colonies should one have to raise bees to sell? Well, Barbara, I don't know if that's a trick question or not, but um, I'd say that uh, I think that you you want to look at the number of colonies that you have and evaluate uh, where you're going to sell them. In other words, if you have two colonies, let's say you have three colonies, leave yourself two, and you want to sell one to a friend, um, th that's an option. But if you're going to get into the business of selling uh, nukes or selling um, queens, I would say you probably want to have you know, 20 or 30 colonies, but that's really going to be up to you. When I moved back to Michigan after being out east for several years, um, 30 some years, uh, we had about 24 colonies and we were raising queens and sold a few nukes. So the number isn't huge, but it's, it also depends upon, you know, we were, you know, we felt like we were in the middle of a desert and people wanted bees and uh, they didn't want packages. So they wanted something else. So it gets to be a real concern. And uh, all right, some beekeepers think that they can select for mite resistant bees by not treating for mites and letting the mite infested bees die every year with the hope that at some point they will have resistant bees. How well does this work? If you're isolated, Barbara, and you had no other beekeepers around, this would probably eventually work. I won't tell you how many years it'll take, probably a number of, uh, of uh, generations for it to settle down. I do know that there are a few beekeepers that claim to have done that, and I've never seen any data from them, nor have I seen them again at meetings. So that always bothers me when there's a one-off one report on this. I think that, all right. Are you still planning to offer a digital version, a third edition, a digital version? Uh, we will be doing a, um, probably do the uh, Apple uh, books again that we did with the second edition. I'm, I'm done with Amazon on books uh, with the, uh, their electronic version. Um, they just don't let you, uh, they, they try to control the whole process. All right. Um, do locally adapted queens live longer or perform better than commercially produced queens? How do you, how long do you expect local queens to live? Well, I can't answer the last one. That depends on how well they're produced. If you raise them uh, three weeks, uh, three months, three years. Um, I think that... Um, a good, good queen ring, I expect a queen to live a year and a half, maybe two. I don't expect them to live a long time. Not anymore. I think there are too many stressors on queens. And uh, do locally adapted queens live longer um, than commercially produced queens? Yeah, I think, it did, who are you comparing? Are you comparing my queens with somebody else's? I think that that's going to be a real, uh, a real challenge. Um, so I think if you have good genetics and good queen ring, um, you, can, you can produce some good queens that are going to do well in your area if they're produced from stock. But on the other hand, it could be, it could be a real question on how they're going to do. So I, I, I don't know if I've danced around that long enough, but it's, it's a tough one. What is the correct amount of oxalic acid to use in mite vapor treatment? I don't know the answer to that. Um, Mike Palmer, hello, Mike. Um, I have a new presentation on brood factories. All right. Okay, well, get a hold of Mike then. Um, when sequestering a queen, how do you know how long to keep her locked up to break this brood cycle? That's a good question. Um, you know, I think you have to balance two things. The, the break, the sequestering, how long do you want to have that uh, colony without brood and the potential damage you may be doing to the colony by not producing more bees. 
if you do this during the nectar flow, if you have the sequestering during the nectar flow and the bees are um, very busy producing a crop of honey and you have a concentrated nectar flow, I think you can probably keep the bees, or the queen sequestered for several weeks. But if you are in an area where things are kind of smattering, you probably want to shorten that down to uh, five to 10 days. Uh, I don't have any data on that. And I hope if somebody does, they can share that. Um, how many drone mother colonies are needed to prevent inbreeding? Uh, when we ran the data at the Starline and Midnight program, we used to recommend um, commercial beekeepers keep at least 200 drone mother colonies. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, when is the best time to feed pollen patties and protein patterns? Is it necessary? And what is the difference between the two, if any, in Virginia? Uh, I don't think Virginia's got any secrets that I know of in terms of nutrition. Depends probably, you know, anywhere is, you know, what's your diversity of plants? Have you got a good spring buildup? Are you getting food from willows and spring uh, trees and uh, flowers? Uh, do you have a good uh, supply of spring food? Um, this goes back to what I said earlier. You need to make a list of the plants that are going to produce in your area. And that has to be based on experience and perhaps working with a mentor and trying to do a good job with uh, what you're doing. Um, when is the best time? I like to feed uh, in the spring, late winter. As soon as the bees, you can get into the bees and put a patty in. Uh, I, I don't like to feed in the fall because I think that messes it with the bees a little too much. And um, uh, pollen patties and protein patties, very few people use pure pollen uh, for two reasons. One is expensive and uh, you have a tremendous risk of feeding, uh, uh, or exposing the bees to, to American fowl brood uh, and uh, chuck brood with pollen, patties made with pollen. So protein patties are probably my preferred, always have been my preferred going back many years. Um, when I was a student at Michigan State, we did do some uh, pure pollen patties from this, the campus apiary. Uh, pollen was collected there, it was put in the freezer in the lab, and we made up uh, pollen and sugar patties. And now I can say the bees loved them and we did not seem to have any problem with the diseases, but we had a, you know, if you will, a closed operation. Any advice on wrapping for winter, pros and cons? Um, I think the further north you go, the more likely you're gonna to wanna to do some wrapping. And uh, we've seen such a, an explosion of you know, polystyrene hives and plastic hives and, and different wraps and so forth. I'm not going to uh, speculate on this. I do know that um, yeah, we don't wrap in, in here where I am. And uh, yet I've got neighbors, uh, neighbor beekeepers in Kalamazoo that got their bees so tightly buttoned up that I'm afraid they're going to suffocate the bees though in the colony. So the different different uh, uh, we don't call it uh, concepts that are at work here. Do you have any references for viral survival viability times on use comb? I don't have any references. Um, I'm going to suggest you contact. Uh, the University of Florida B lab, uh, Jamie Ellis's lab, and um, and try to see if they have any information because that's where I got some of this exposure to uh, viral, uh, excuse me, uh, viruses and longevity. So I think that might be a good place to look there. 